She's a co-worker. She didn't take it very well, though. It's been eight months since the rejection, but I still have to work with her, and I find myself wanting to... When I get asked out, I turn them down. This is where they act offended, as though I insulted them. What's going on, everybody? Hope everybody's feeling good. Hope everybody's doing well. We are back with another story post, guys. I'll put this up on the screen if you want to check it out. But you guys read the title. Let's just get into it. So, Reddit dating advice. Girl I rejected at work is being a massive D. <laughs> I'm 25 and she... She's 17. Whoa. So for obvious reason, the answer was always going to be no. She's a co-worker. She didn't take it very well, though. It's been eight months since the rejection, but I still have to work with her, and I find myself wanting to place her head between a car door and shut it hard. Obviously, I wouldn't do that, but that's how infuriating I find her to be. She knows a lot of women at the store have crushes on me, and she knows of the women have confessed to me. But she keeps trying to embarrass me in front of the customers and people. I ignore her behavior, but it's like it's a compulsive tick or something because it never ends. She caused a massive argument between another female co-worker because they both like me. Last week while I was serving a customer, she said, it sucks that you lost the only woman who would ever love you. She was referring to the other girl she had a fight with earlier in the year, and it was meant very much as an insult. But since the context was missing to the customer, it sounded like she was begging for me to take her back. I told her off for it, and she apologized. But she keeps doing the same crap over and over. Today, she says loudly in front of all these co-workers, I don't know why you dislike me. I'm an angel. Oh, wait, I remember. It's because I said how no one could ever love you last week, lol. I'd like to think I don't have too much of an ego, but I do take pride in my appearance and people's perception of me. So the fact that she says crap like this loudly and intentionally so other people can hear just really drives me up the wall because it makes me feel lame and small whenever she does it. I act like it doesn't bother me. But on the inside, it's infuriating. Wow. This old childish girl, dude, go to HR or whatever. Go to a manager. Go to a manager and get her fired. Get the get 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 coworkers to. Yep, she is doing this. She's harassing and she's harassing you, sir. If what if it was the other way around, and we could switch the ages too? You know, um, you're hitting on this woman at work, not feeling you. She rejected you, and here you are just being a douche. Oh, too bad your first love dumped you. Ha ha ha. Too bad you don't like me because I'm perfect. I'm a perfect gentleman. You know, if you're doing all this, man, she would have got you booted from that job. And you would have had a hard time finding another job because you would have tried to use them as a reference and uh, it wouldn't have went well. They would have spread the word, gossiped, uh, gossiped about you around town. You the you're the weirdo guy. You're, <laughs> you're the weirdo. Yeah, watch out for him. No. Nah. Get get out, get her fired, dude. Yeah, in this case, yeah, it needs to be some type of revenge. I'd get her fired if I were you. Let's check out these comments. Someone said, quit your job or take it up with the manager as harassment. Yeah, I say take it up with the manager as harassment. I'm gonna, not going to tell him to quit his job. You know, he might be, I don't know what, what he's doing. He might be paying his way through grad school. He might just be working there because he need a job for whatever reason you know, getting on his feet. And I don't know, he, this, it's a job for him. He found the job. He's doing it. I, the first thing I'm not going to tell him is quit his job, you know, definitely take it up with a manager though. 
This is correct answer. She is 17, basically a child still in terms of maturity. Communicate appropriately. Sounds like you've tried. And when that doesn't work, communicate like you're in a business setting where she's engaging in workplace harassment. And if it and if this doesn't work or that process doesn't seem worth it, move on. This is harassment. Talk to HR or your manager. This kid is super unprofessional. Yeah. Though she has a crush on you, no experience in dating, and most likely your rejection made her embarrassed. She took it the wrong way, and now she wants payback. <laughs> yeah, just like a she's like a big I mean she is a kid, but she's gonna be this way forever. Or most likely wanted it, but by now it's simply a hobby. I would tell about her arguments to the boss, have her fired, call because it's causing damage to the whole workplace, not only you. This certainly sounds like a hostile work environment to me. Just tell your manager she is saying inappropriate things when cons when customers are around. You're so full of yourself and you work in retail, LOL. Wow. Here's OP. I mean, to be fair, you have gone through my post history and you did literally respond to my post in which I referred to myself as having a stick up my arse. That's not something you admit to people because it's fun or easy. I was just being brutally honest, and I'd like to know how to work on myself. Nobody is perfect, but at least I've demonstrated that I can acknowledge my faults and show an honest attempt to try to work on them. From personal experience, I find the biggest a-holes are in denial. Having said all that, I am genuinely surprised that you're telling me I'm full of myself, as if we are somehow both unaware of the fact. All I'm saying you do is trolling someone who is admitting that they have a problem and needs help, which you're ironically not doing. You'd rather play part in making the person's problem bigger. It takes a special kind of person to do that. But if that's what you would rather do, far be it from me to try and stop you. And yes, I work in retail. I also study and facilitate the cost of study by working in retail. I figured that a lot of people, when I was in college, I, I worked at a, a chicken place. I, I, I worked at Pizza Hut and I worked at a chicken place. I mean, college students w work retail and all type of stuff all the time. Your implication is that retail is a low is a lowly job. I think most people would agree you're an a-hole for trying to degrade anyone for their job title. If you're finding I keep owning you, it's because you're assuming to know someone you literally don't know. I am always going to come out and easily challenge your false preconceptions. I think the one thing you've been right about is so far is that I can be conceited, which is by my own admission. Well, it sounds like he has a, somebody attacking him on all his posts and they're making fun of him. Um, look, man, I don't, I don't know. I can't see his other posts. Um, I don't know what he's talked about before, but in this specific story this situation yeah get her fired get her fired she's mad because she got rejected oh go cry a river i'm sorry not sorry guys let's check out another story all right read it true off my chest why are women offended when I turn them down? Oh. I'm a 35-year-old man and not a catch at all. I'm six foot one, almost 300 pounds. Chubby for sure. I work two jobs and I am divorced. I've been divorced for about 10 years. I have been single for all that time. I was done with relationships then and still am now. I don't get tons of women throwing themselves at me, but I am a nice and respectful person, so statistically, it is bound to happen once in a while. When I get asked out, I turn them down. This is where they act offended, as though I insulted them. I say something like, sorry, I'm not interested in dating, and it is usually a polite refusal like that. This usually leads them into, into them being angry or upset. Sometimes I get insulted. What is so offensive about a man wanting to stay single? To be clear, I don't flirt. I don't go home with women. I am single and celibate. I am happy this way. I dated. I was married. And I ended it. I learned I am not a good significant other. Edit. Few things. 
One, for people getting stuck on my weight, average weight for a man of 6'1 is 166 to 202. Last I weighed myself, I was 275. I am sure it has gone up and down in the last few years, but I am not obese or as large as you are imagining. Number two, when I say when women ask me out doesn't happen often, it really doesn't. Maybe once or twice in six months, not uncommon for my area. Sometimes it's a friend I have known a long time, and sometimes it's someone I just met at work and got along with. Number three, not every woman gets offended, but it is a common enough reaction that I posted here. Number four, for those who are not medical experts or my personal doctor telling me I am obese, I will no longer reply to you. Below is my reply. BMI is is an inaccurate measurement of body fat content and does not take into account muscle mass, bone density, overall body composition, and racial and sexual differences. Say researchers from the School of Medicine in the University of Pennsylvania. This is from an article in 2019 from medicalnewstoday.com. So unless you are a medical expert with all the tools and not just BMI, do not tell people they are obese. I do not deny my weight. But I happen to know if I was obese, my doctor would tell me. Wow. (laughs) Let me give my thoughts. I, I, I get his frustration with going to the comments and people are focusing on the smallest thing, not even the point of the story. I see that a lot. Whether it's a video I've done or I've seen, and it's not like super common, but it could be a different video, some video I watched on YouTube, or if I'm reading a story online and I read the comments, sometimes people really get stuck on just one thing. And I'm just like, uh, I don't think that was the point. You know, so I do get that frustration. Um, but the point of the story. Women are getting offended when he turns them down. This man's not bragging, oh, they hit on me and I turn them down. No, he said the the couple times, the few times or the couple times it happens in a year, which is, you know, not a lot. He says, no, this man is happy focusing on his own life. He's been married. He's been in a relationship. No relationships, no marriage for this guy. He doesn't want to do it. And women can't believe it. They're probably looking at him like, but... You know, it's not like you're a catch. You know, I'm giving you a chance. You know, I'm doing you a favor. That's how these girls are looking. That's how they're thinking. I'm doing you a favor. How can you turn this down? You know, they're trying to use him to build their confidence. And he's he's genuinely not interested. He's not being a douche. No, thank you. I don't want you. You know, he's not being a douche about it. He genuinely does not want a relationship or has time for that. They don't respect that, though. They don't respect that because how dare you turn them down? It's like, how do you how dare you say no? It's not just saying no to your wife or your girlfriend and her getting upset. Women, period, do not like the word no. They're like big children. How dare you say no to me? They don't like the word no. No? What do you mean no? Who do you think you are? It's ridiculous. Let's check out these comments here. Somebody said, most people dislike rejection. Learning to deal with it is just part of life. And men and women have different struggles when it comes to rejection. Men tend to deal with it more frequently, but I think it hits women a little harder. In their skewed mindset, it tells them that if somebody as unattractive as you rejects them, then there is literally no hope left for them. You've also offended their ego. How can someone as low as you turn them down according to their mindset? You should be grateful to even have them look at you. Unfortunately, unfortunately, that is how they're looking. And I'm not saying this dude is probably all he did. He put his weight out there and everything. That doesn't make this guy a hideous person. You know, that doesn't make him a hideous person. Um, But there, there, there are, but. If they're comparing him to their favorite celebrity or their ex who was in tip top shape or looked a little better or the guy they went out with who just pumped and dumped them or whatever, or the guy they are getting attention from in the DMs who looks different. 
they're they're looking at you like how dare you because their whole intention anyway is to get with you use you and still get banged out by those other guys that they like you know and you're just like i'm not i don't have time for it no i don't want to deal with it how dare you just like he said how dare you you should be lucky that i looked your direction (laughs) you know that's how cocky they are Someone said, I am the same way. I've been married twice. I always had to have a boyfriend. Now I have been single for seven years. I haven't dated anyone either. No friends with benefits. Just me and I love it. It's awesome doing what I want, when I want. Spending money on myself and not having to explain anything to anyone is the greatest feeling in the world. My life is so peaceful. Good for you. Enjoy every minute of it. Nice. Guys, on that note. Let me know what you think about this in the comments. Ah, uh, the rejection, the rejection. It hurts. They don't like it. Guys, let me know what you think about this in the comments. I will catch you guys at the next one. I left the love of my life because I thought I could do better. Now I'm childless and alone at 42. Oh. Laughing and dancing with my fiance at our engagement party. Surrounded by our family and friends, I looked at Matthew and felt certain I had met the man I was going to spend the rest of my life with. Quite simply, he was my soulmate, desperately in love and had our future life together mapped out. First, we would save to buy our home. Then would come romantic wedding ceremony and children would follow. It all seemed so simple to my naive 19-year-old self, the girl who had it all. So why, 20 years later, do I find myself single, childless, and tormented by the fact that I have thrown away the only true chance of happiness I have ever had? Eight years after that wonderful engagement party in 1989, I walked away from dear, devoted, loyal Matthew. Convinced that somewhere out there, a better, more exciting, more fulfilling life awaited me. Only there wasn't. Now I am 42 and I have all the trappings of success. A high-flying career, financial security, and a home in the heart of London's trendy Notting Hill. But I don't have the one thing I crave more than anything. A loving husband and family. You see, I never did find another man who offered everything Matthew did. Who understood me and loved me like he did. Someone who was my best friend as well as my lover. Today seeing friends with their children around them tortures me. As I know I I am unlikely ever to have a family of my own. I think about the times Matthew and I talked about having children. Even discussing the names we would choose. I cannot believe I turned my back on so much happiness. Instead here I am back on the singles market. Looking for the very thing I discarded with barely a backward glance all those years ago. I know I can't have Matthew back, and it hurts when I hear snippets of information about his life and how content he is. Fifteen years after I ended our relationship, he is happily married. At this time of year, so many people will be assessing their lives and relationships, wondering if the grass is greener on the other side. Many will mistake contentment before boredom. Forgetting to cherish the good things they have. I would urge those who are considering walking away from such riches to think again. How different things would be for me now if only I'd listened to Matthew when he pleaded with me not to leave him in 1997. And I, arrogantly, thought that somehow I could put him on ice and return to him. Matthew was romantic but incredibly practical. Something that would later come to annoy me. He gives to me at Christmas a leather jacket and a pair of thermal leggings. Two weeks later, when we'd been seeing each other for less than a month, he proposed. In the summer of 89, Matthew proposed properly with a diamond solitary ring. Two months later, we held our engagement party for the 40 friends and family at the little house where we were renting at the time. The following year, we bought a tiny starter home which we moved into with with furniture we had we had bagged, borrowed, and stolen. I was in my first junior row as a woman's magazine, and Matthew worked fitting tires and exhaust. 
So our combined salaries meant we struggled to make the mortgage payments, telling ourselves that it wouldn't be long before we were earning more. But then the housing market crashed and we were plunged into negative equity. Struggling should have brought us closer together. And at first it did. But, but as time went on and my magazine career and salary advanced, I started to resent Matthew as he drifted from one dead-end job to another. I still loved him, but I began to feel embarrassed by his blue-collar jobs, annoyed that despite his intelligence, he didn't have a career. Then he bought a blue and pink Volkswagen Beetle. Why couldn't he drive a normal car? Things that now seem incredibly insignificant began to niggle. I began to wish he was more sophisticated and earn more. I felt envious of friends with better-off partners who were able to support them as they started their families. I stopped seeing Matthew as my equal. I stopped seeing all the qualities that had made me fall in love with him. His fierce intelligence, our shared sense of humor, his determination not to follow the crowd. Instead, I saw someone who was holding me back. I encouraged him to find a career and was thrilled when he was accepted to join the police in 95. It should have heralded a new chapter in our lives. We went from spending every evening and weekend together to hardly seeing one another. Matthew was doing around the clock shifts while I worked long hours on the launch of a new magazine. Our sex life had dwindled and, and nights out together were rare. I stopped appreciating little things he did. He was my best friend, yet I took him totally for granted. After festering for weeks about his shortcomings, I told Matthew I was leaving. We spent hours talking and crying and he tried to convince me to stay, but I was adamant. My parents were horrified that I was walking away from a man that, that they felt was right for me. My father's words to me that day continued to haunt me. Aaron, think carefully about what you're doing. There's a lot to be said for someone who truly loves you. But I refused to listen. Convinced there would be another better Mr. Wright waiting around the corner. I moved into a rented flat a few miles away and embraced single life with a vengeance. By now, I was an editor on a national magazine. Life was one long round of premieres and dinners or drinks at parties. Matthew and I remained close, even telling each other about new relationships. I did not realize it at the time, but I would never speak to him again. Shortly afterwards, I met Richard. It was a whirlwind whirlwind, and within a year, we were engaged in buying a farmhouse in Norfolk countryside while I continued my journalistic career commuting to London. He was a successful singer, and he had toured the country. I thought I had finally found the excitement and love that I craved. But Matthew was never far from my thoughts, and Richard complained that I often brought him into conversations, even comparing them both. They were so different, though. Although outwardly romantic, Richard was repeatedly unfaithful, and I never felt secure enough to start a family with him. Eventually, after three and a half years together, he walked out, having admitted his latest affair partner was pregnant by him. My life fell apart over the next year. I struggled to pull myself back together and did a lot of soul searching. I finally understood what my father had meant. I realized Matthew was the only person who had loved and understood me. When I heard through a mutual friend that he had split up with Sarah, I wrote to him, apologizing and asking for forgiveness and a second chance. It was six years since we had last spoken. But naively, I thought he would want to hear from me. Though it was unsurprising, I never heard from him, despite writing several times over the next few months. I left it at birthday and Christmas cards, thinking he'd find a way to get in touch if he, never, if he ever changed his mind. Then I heard a couple of years ago Matthew had married his new partner, Nicola. For a few months, I couldn't breathe. Then the tears came. It's been 11 years since Matthew and I last spoke. And I have to accept that the door has closed. Yes, you do. Perhaps he has found what he is looking for, and I am a distant memory. I have had one other significant relationship since Richard, with Rob, but that recently ended after four years. 
Rob reminded me a lot of Matthew. He was decent and honorable. The life and soul of the party, but, but with a kind and sensitive side. But we were each too jaded by previous heartbreak to make it work. And while I wanted children, he had a grown-up son and didn't want to start over again. So once again, I am on my own, my mind full of if-onlys. If only I'd stayed with Matthew. We'd almost certainly be married with children. Or maybe Matthew wasn't the right man. I will never know. I will never know the answer, but my decision to leave him has definitely cost me the chance of ever becoming a mother. Now I can only look back and admonish my selfish, younger self. When I visit friends and family back in our hometown, I can't help but hope I'll bump into Matthew. I'd like to think I'd say sorry, that I will always be there for him, but I would be surprised if he turned his back on me and kept walking. Those out there thinking of walking away from humdrum relationships, I would say don't mistake contentment for unhappiness, as I did. It could be a choice you'll regret for the rest of your life. Wow, let me give my thoughts. Oh, the regrets. Oh, the regret. So she's now 42 years old. No children, no marriage. She was with the perfect guy, guys. Perfect guy. He was great. And you know what she did? She found a reason to hate him. She found a reason. Remember that even though, like, because you could say, well, he made, he made less money than her, so he wasn't perfect. But beforehand, he didn't care. He had everything she wanted in a man. Oh, you're perfect. You're so romantic. You're the best. Got with him, and she had to find a reason. Chaos. He wanted chaos. She wanted to ruin a great thing. Guys, do you know how often that happens? They have something perfect that they love, that they adore, and they gotta find something wrong with it. I mean, that's what she did. You don't make enough money. Why'd you buy that ugly car? It's embarrassing. You should drive a normal car. Mm, mm, mm. She left him and realized that, oh crap, I messed up. Thought you could find something better. And then realized, oh, I do love him. No, you don't love him, you're just selfish. You're just a selfish person. You deserve to be alone, in my opinion. Guys, let me know what you think about this in the comments. 